In the, Revolutionary, in the Revolutionary War, the initial government made by the 13 col colonies was a mess. Uh, they were not under the Constitution, but under the Articles of Confederation. And the government had no real way to fund itself. In fact, it was so poorly funded that they had no food for the military or to provide food for the military. And this meant that many of the soldiers of the Continental Army wanted to turn around and leave. Therefore, Washington had to figure out a way to rally his troops and to increase morale. And he did so in a very subtle way. On one occasion, he had to read a letter called the Newburgh Address, or the first Newburgh Address. And he opened the envelope, and he began to read, but he paused and stopped, and then he said, gentlemen, you will per permit me to put on my spectacles, for I have not only grown gray, but almost blind in the service of my country. Washington knew people would only follow a good leader if that leader was willing to make the same sacrifices as those who followed him. And he, made, he makes this very subtle comment saying that, hey, I'm out here on the front lines with you. I'm growing old, I'm growing blind, I'm growing weak, but I'm here doing it with you. And it was this subtle comment that caused his men to recommit themselves to the fight. We as Christians have been given many difficult responsibilities and decisions to make in our life and our service to the kingdom. But thankfully, our Lord has left us many powerful examples to follow. And I want us to consider one such example right now, Jesus' prayer or series of prayers in the gardens. And I want us to examine the attitude by which he carried himself and then ask how we can manifest the same attitude in our own life. Now, before we get into the, prayers, or the series of prayers, I want us to consider the surrounding context and, and what is going on. We know that when we read the Old Testament, there are a series of themes and motifs that replayed themselves and often replayed themselves in the New Testament, or you could even say find their fulfillment in the New Testament. For example, we know uh, roughly about 550 years before this event, in the days of Zechariah, God tells Zechariah in chapter 11, verse 13, that his people do not value him. They only value him the worth of a slave, only 30 pieces of silver. And this finds its fulfillment here, as we see that when God comes in the person of Jesus, Jesus Christ, that's how much his people value him. They're paying 30 pieces of silver, although not to keep him, but to get rid of him. And as Jesus is in the process of being sold for 30 pieces of silver, he makes his ascent to the Mount of Olives. Now, why does he go to the Mount of Olives? Well, Luke tells us in Luke chapter 22, verse 39, that this was his custom, this was his habit. This is what he did all the time. And if he wanted to hide, if he wanted to run, if he wanted to not get arrested, he would go somewhere else. But he specifically goes where he knows he can be found. And it's interesting to note when we consider passages like 2 Samuel 15, 30, that uh, David made a similar trek up to the Mount of Olives as he was being betrayed, as his people were seeking to kill him. And he made his way up in tears and in grief because people sought his life. Although he made his trek up the Mount of Olives to exit, to leave, to go regroup, to retake Jerusalem. But Jesus makes his trek up the mountain uh, not to run, but to stay and to face his fate. And he, as he does, he musters his strength with prayer and with the fellowship of his friends. Now let's consider the dilemma that, that God has placed before him. We know that when we read the scriptures, there are many dilemmas that God has given his people throughout time. Uh, often there's a, 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 a bad option, and often there's a good option. And normally the good option is to choose life. For example, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 through 17, in the Garden of Eden, God tells Adam and Eve, From any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So they could eat of any tree, uh, any tree and live, especially the tree of life, but there was one tree that they could choose that would bring about death. We see that God gives uh, his people a similar dilemma through Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15. Right as they're about to enter the land of promise, he says, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. And in verse 20, he says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. 
Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. God has always set life before his people, and he has encouraged them to choose it. But humanity has so corrupted his way to the point that at this point in time, there is no longer a path that leads to life. So therefore, in order to create a new and living way, God sets the opposite before his son. Uh, Essentially, what he lays before him is the path of death. And he wants him to choose death so that he can create a new and living way for everyone. But we should note that this is not a a peaceful death. This is not a death where your aged body simply goes to sleep and does not wake up. This is a death that is slow, excruciating, humiliating, and methodical. Not to mention Jesus is very young, at least in reference to his human nature. He's in his early 30s. He's still in his prime. At least I hope being in your early 30s is still in your prime. And, And that's where he's at. You know, when you get up in in years, there's sometimes an appeal to death, or there's this sense of being free from the pain and trials of this life. But when you're young and you're prime, death is the last thing on your mind, and yet this is what is before him. Now let us consider how he grapples with this in Matthew 26. And if you will turn with me there, let's read Matthew 26, and let us read... Verses 36 through 46 together. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for an hour. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Now, let us first consider what Jesus went through in this experience. Notice what he tells his disciples. He says, my soul is deeply grieved, even to the point of death. Luke tells us in Luke chapter 22, verse 44, that being in agony, he was praying fervently, or very fervently, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling upon the ground. Now, there's uh, a few ways in which you can interpret that. You, you know, some would argue that he was under so much psychological torment that the stress in his body actually caused him to bleed blood. That's one way of interpreting it. Another way of understanding this verse is saying that he, he just sweat so profusely that his sweat was so thick that it was as blood. Uh, regardless, uh, he is suffering under the anticipation of what is to come. And he specifically prays that if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But what does Jesus mean by his cup? This is not a metaphor we uh, use very often. Well, in, in ancient times, and especially in the scriptures, one's cup often was a metaphor to describe one's fate, portion, or destiny. And when we read the scripture, sometimes this is used in a very positive way. Sometimes it's used in a very negative way. Other times it's even used uh, to refer to the wrath of God. And, and Jesus knows exactly what cup is before him. And he knows, according to the scriptures and what he has set out to do, what lies before him the very next day. And as a result of, the, and as a result of this, he is distraught on every level because, he, one, he doesn't want to suffer, and two, he does not want to die. So in light of this, let's explore a difficult question that we may have wondered at a certain point in time. Do we as people of God always have to want exactly 
what God wants? And I suppose that's a loaded question. And, and maybe we could answer with a yes and no. Let's just explore this for a moment. Uh, for one, I think we can certainly say Jesus wanted exactly what God wanted for the world and humanity. Their, their plan was in alignment, alignment from the very beginning and what they set out to do. But I think it's also fair to say that Jesus very clearly did not want the cross for obvious reasons. Uh, and, and we know, uh, as we discussed a few weeks ago in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, that uh, it appears Jesus does not currently, at this point in the narrative, have all the knowledge he once had access to when he was with God. We explored uh, a few weeks ago in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, that when Jesus came to earth, he emptied himself of some of the privileges of his godhood. And some of this seems to refer to the knowledge he once possessed. So perhaps what he is doing is probing to see if maybe there is another way, maybe there's another strategy, maybe there is a way to fulfill all things that does not involve the cross. And ideally, certainly that's what he wants. Of course, he's willing to, to take the cross, but if he doesn't have to, he certainly wants to avoid that. So generally speaking, on one level, God, uh, Jesus wants exactly what God wants. But if there's a way to do it in a, in a more convenient way, to say the least, that's certainly what he wants to pursue. And I think this is important to realize because uh, I, I think when we read the scriptures, uh, we see that many of the saints of old often struggle to understand the will of God. And I'm not necessarily saying that of Jesus. Jesus certainly has the bigger picture in mind more so than anyone else. But when we especially read the Psalms and, and read the prophets, we often see the, the men and women of God often ask very difficult questions concerning evil and suffering and the, own, and their, and the challenges they face. Questions such as, how come and how long and why not? And, and though Jesus has the bigger picture in mind, he is still asking questions in a similar vein. In this case, it's, does it have to be this way? And I think we've all asked similar questions about that in our own life for various reasons. Does this thing in my life have to be this way? And does it have to be this way for now or, or forever? And I, I think this is helpful to observe to show how even the Son of God struggled with what was before him. And when I say struggle, I don't mean that he was not willing. I mean that it was a challenging thing for him to go through. It was something that put a lot of stress and pain on his mind and his body. And I, I think sometimes Christians uh, get the impression that they have to have this chipper, upbeat attitude with everything in life, regardless of what happens. But we see that not even Jesus was unfazed by what he experienced, but experienced every bitter emotion just as we do. And in light of this, he prays for something different. Uh, and he knows the scriptures, and, and he knows the history of the world. And he knows that God very often is inclined to answer the prayers of those who, 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 uh, who call on him. Uh, in reference to uh, Hannah, she asked for but a son, and God gave her many children. In reference to Hezekiah on his deathbed, he was about to die, and he asked for life, and God gave him 15 more years. And so Jesus is praying intensely and fervently for a different outcome again and again. But the answer is clear, this is the only way. And, and I think in light, light of this, we should ask, what happens when we pray and we pray and the same obstacle is still before us? Notice what Jesus does at the end of every request. In verse 39, he says, yet not as I will, but as you will. And in verse 41, he says, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Uh, Jesus is doing exactly how he taught us to pray in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Uh, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says that as we're praying, we should say, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this part of the prayer may not be as much a, a petition per se, but a statement of commitment or acceptance of the will of God. Basically, when we pray this, it's a way to preface our prayers by saying, whatever I ask, whatever I petition you for now, at the end of the day, I want your will to be done, even though it may not line up exactly with what I am praying for right now. And as we see, this is not something Jesus said flippantly. This is something that Jesus laced with all of his prayers. And every time he is making this 
heavy request before God, he is always ending by saying, not my will, but your will. And, uh, and, and uh, so, so, you know, we could say, you know, did Jesus want the cross? Well, no, but did he want the ultimate will of God to be fulfilled? And the answer is yes. And in light of that, he was willing to set aside this, his own personal desire and his own will, if I can say it that way, for the will of his Father. And we should ask ourselves, do we share this same attitude? Of course, our God often blesses us and gives us far more than we ask. But we also know that in our service to the kingdom, we are often asked to endure things or to handle things or to put ourselves into challenging situations that are not easy, to say the least. And the apostles would know this uh, very well. Uh, shortly after the uh, death and resurrection of Jesus, uh, they would experience all forms of persecution, including imprisonment, torture, and even death, all because they knew their sweat, blood, and pain was contributing to something greater than themselves. Paul even emphasizes this in Acts chapter 14, verse 22. He tells the disciples, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And we, as citizens of the kingdom of God, are often inquire, required to embrace things that are difficult or to abstain from the things that enthrall us the most. And the question is, do we make God the center of our lives? Uh, of, of course, in our own lives, we have multiple things competing for our attention. You may even say we have multiple wills competing for our attention. We know we have the will of our family, which we consider deeply, the will of our spouse, the will of our children, maybe even the will of society. Uh, and sometimes these wills all line up in perfect harmony with what God wills for us in our life. Uh, other times they don't. Uh, sometimes we may find ourselves in situations where the will of God stands in contrast to everything else we have to choose from. And sometimes this creates discomfort. Sometimes this creates pain on a psychological level. Uh, sometimes, depending on where you live, this might impact you on a financial level or a physical level as well. And this is something that the person who is considering becoming a Christian should, should wrestle with before they make the commitment. Can I always make God the center of my life? But we should ask why. Why are we as people of God? And why was Jesus required to make the will of God the center or the center of our lives? Well, because if we boil it down, this is essentially what love is. Love is when, if, if, if we're just to boil it down, is when we choose someone else's needs, someone else's desires, or someone else's will above our own. And hopefully if you have a few healthy relationships in your life, you know this to be true. You know this to be true in reference to your kids, in reference to your wife, in reference to your parents. Uh, you know, if, if you have many healthy relationships, you know every day you are sacrificing your will, your desire, or your need for the sake maybe of your children, for your spouse, or for your family. And this is exactly what God requires of us. He requires us to sacrifice our will in service to Him. But as we see clearly from Matthew chapter 26, this is not, one, this is not one-sided by any means. Uh, God came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ, who set aside his own desire for life, his own desire for, for, for bliss and, and harmony for the cross, for our sake and for the glory of God. And this is the challenge for us. Can we emulate this same attitude in our own lives? Can we pray these very words every single day? Not my will, but your will. Now, of course, we know uh, following the will of God always ends in a wonderful result. For Jesus, it would be becoming king of the universe and saving all mankind. That's a pretty great thing. But the challenging part is what it costs to actually get there. Uh, the, the, the course between point A and point B, that is what induces fear, anxiety, and sweat as blood. And even though our ultimate goal uh, will be wonderful in every way, uh, to be on, to, to share the throne with Christ, to share in his victory and his inheritance as his fellow heir, this is wonderful for us. But the challenge for us is 
actually getting there, sacrificing our will in the meantime to actually achieve such a goal, especially when we come to dilemmas in our life when we realize our will is different from the will of our fathers. But Jesus, because of his love for the Father and his love for us, sacrificed his own desire for us all. And thus, instead of running or hiding or or summoning his angelic legionaries to fight on his behalf, he simply waited his fate. But what did Jesus do to strengthen himself? Well, he prayed with friends. Uh, And notice what we see in in, uh, uh, verse Uh, 36 and verse 38. Uh, Notice he comes to the garden with his friends and he tells them to pray and keep watch. But what does he mean by keep watch? Growing up when I've I've read this passage, I assume what Jesus was saying is they need to be on the lookout so he can kind of pray in private so no one interrupts. That's kind of how I always uh, assumed uh, that's what Jesus meant. But it seems that Jesus has something very different in mind. Remember in Matthew chapter 26, verse 31, he reminds the disciples that they are all going to fall away that night. They're all essentially going to forfeit their loyalty to Christ. We also note in verse 41 that he links this idea of watching with prayer and overcoming temptation. And, and Peter does the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Uh, he tells us as Christians to be watchful because... Satan prowls around like a roaring, uh, a, a roaring lion. The idea seems to not necessarily to be watchful in the sense of being on the lookout, but be alert to, as to their own temptation and trials that they are going to experience. And this is something that, that Jesus has been preparing them for months, maybe even years in advance. We know all the way in Matthew chapter 26, he was preparing them for what was to come. And he knew that if he was struggling, if he was suffering, if if he felt like he had the weight of the world on his shoulders, he certainly knew that his disciples were going to have a tough time as well. Therefore, he tells them to be alert, to be self-aware of what is about to happen, and to pray. And I think this is important because Jesus knew how powerful prayer was, and, and no matter how difficult the situation, one can find strength and focus in prayer. This is what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. It says, In the days of his flesh, he offered up prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one who is able to save from death. And he was heard because of his piety. And Luke tells us in Luke chapter 22, verse 43, that God sent an angel to strengthen him for what he was about to endure. And he knew that, that if he was being challenged and, 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 and was suffering on a psychological and physical level of, of what was about to, to happen, his disciples would as well. And he knew that if he could find strength in prayer, certainly they could as well. And I think this is part of the reason why he is uh, frustrated with them, because they keep falling asleep. Now, in their defense, you know, they probably had a busy week, and, uh, you know, they're probably miserable as to what's about to, to happen. I know when I get depressed and, and worn out, I like to sleep too. And while that can be good sometimes, Jesus emphasized the fact that, no, you guys need to be praying right now so that you don't enter into temptation, so that you can overcome what's going to happen, but they continue to sleep. And I think this is an important lesson for us, that when we pray to God every single day, We should always pray with the mindset, and even in our own words, expressing this idea that we ultimately want His will. And if we we live our lives with that attitude and with that perspective, when we do come across these challenging dilemmas in our life, we will pick the decision or we'll make the choice that is most in line with the will of God. And let's be honest, uh, we'll be better off that way. Uh, I can think of plenty of decisions I have made in my life that were in accordance with my will, and I can't think of a single one that made me more happy or more fulfilled or better off in any way. Now, of course, following the will of God is always more difficult, and it is always more challenging, but there is nothing more fulfilling and nothing that brings more peace and harmony with Him and with our fellow man than this. And as we conclude, we should reflect. 
if you're, if you're here today and you are a Christian, you should ask, is God's will still the center of my life? And if not, why not? Have I filled the center of my life with something else? Maybe it's my will. Maybe it's the will of someone else in my life. Maybe it's a loved one or a friend. Or if you're here today and you're not a Christian and you've yet to make the will of God the center of your life, you should ask, am I now willing to do that? Even though it'll be difficult, as we know, there's nothing more rewarding or fulfilling than this in this life and the life that is to come. As we conclude, I, I want us to touch on, on one other point, and it may seem completely out of context or out, 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 off kilter, but I think this passage points out something very important. For thousands of years, many religious leaders have explored the idea of syncretism, the idea that we can tie multiple different religious traditions and thoughts and ideas together and we can treat them as though they are all the same. There are many people today who believe that all religious thought and all religious traditions are from God and get us there equally. Now, I think the passage we've explored tonight actually points the opposite because essentially what Jesus is praying for the, the whole time is another way. He says, if this cup can pass from me, let it. If there's another way to bring someone to God, that's what Jesus is praying for. And you would think if the Eightfold Path could get someone to God, or achieving nirvana could get someone to God, or just living a moral, righteous life could get someone to God, you would think that, G that God would give his son a pass and say, you know what, we have these other strategies, we're okay, you do not have to do this. But that's not what he says. Uh, now, of course, God isn't verbally speaking in the passage as far as we know, but this is what he communicates with, with what we would perceive as silence, that this is the only way. And this is why Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Because Jesus and what he has done has provided the only way. And, and if you come across anyone who, who suggests this syncretistic approach to scripture, you should take him to this passage and say, you know, if there are other ways, what does this say about God? And what does this say about the sacrifice of Christ? And if you're here today and you believe that Jesus is the only way, and you're willing to pursue his way because you believe that he is the son of God, and you're willing to repent of your sins and put him on in baptism, uh, we'd be glad to help you with that right now. But if you're here tonight and, and you feel that you're struggling to make the will of God the center of your life, we have all been there. And, uh, you know, Jesus knew the solution. He knew prayer and friends, especially Christian friends, can make all the difference in the world. So allow us to pray for you. Allow us to help you and encourage you in any way that we can. If there's anything we can do for you spiritually, please come forward as we stand and sing.